chapter four of campaigning with grant by horace porter this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter four grant's preparations for the second day in the wilderness hancock flushed with victory grant at a critical moment the crisis of the wilderness grant's demeanor in the field grant's peculiarities in battle grant's confidence in success the general-in-chief as aide to a drover confusion caused by a night attack grant administers a reprimand grant after the battle the wilderness a unique combat at four o'clock the next morning may six we were awakened in our camp by the sound of burnside's men moving along the germana road they had been marching since one a m hurrying on to reach the left of warren the members of the headquarters mess soon after assembled to partake of a hasty breakfast the general made rather a singular meal preparatory to so exhausting a day as that which was to follow he took a cucumber sliced it poured some vinegar over it and partook of nothing else except a cup of strong coffee the first thing he did after rising from the table was to call for a fresh supply of cigars his colored servant bill brought him two dozen after lighting one of them he filled his pockets with the rest he then went over to the knoll and began to walk back and forth slowly upon the cleared portion of the ridge while listening for hancock's attack on the left we heard the sound of heavy firing on the right and found that the enemy had attacked sedgwick and warren warren afterward had one brigade pretty roughly handled and driven back some distance but no ground was permanently lost or gained by either side on that part of the line promptly at five o'clock the roar of battle was heard in hancock's front and before seven he had broken the enemy's line and driven him back in confusion more than a mile the general now instructed me to ride out to hancock's front inform him of the progress of burnside's movement explain the assistance that officer was expected to render and tell him more fully the object of sending to his aid stevenson's division of burnside's corps i met hancock on the orange plank road not far from its junction with the brock road actively engaged in directing his troops and restoring the confusion in their alignment caused by the desperate fighting and the difficult character of the ground all thought of the battle which raged about us was to me for a moment lost in a contemplation of the dramatic scene presented in the person of the knightly corps commander he had just driven the enemy a mile and a half his face was flushed with the excitement of victory his eyes were lighted by the fire of battle his flaxen hair was thrust back from his temples his right arm was extended to its full length in pointing out certain positions as he gave his orders and his commanding form towered still higher as he rose in his stirrups to peer through the openings in the woods he was considered the handsomest general officer in the army and at this moment he looked like a spirited portrait from the hands of a master artist with the deep brown of the dense forest forming a fitting background it was itself enough to inspire the troops he led to deeds of unmatched heroism he had been well dubbed hancock the superb this expression dated back to the field of williamsburg at the close of that battle general mcclellan sent a telegram to his wife in new york announcing his victory and as she and hancock were old friends he added the words hancock was superb the newspapers got hold of the dispatch and the designation was heralded in prominent headlines throughout the entire press the description was so appropriate that the designation clung to him through life along the line of hancock's advance the enemy's dead were everywhere visible his wounded strewed the roads prisoners had been captured and battle flags had been taken but hancock was now compelled to halt and restore the contact between his commands before nine o'clock however he was pushing out again on the orange plank road and another fierce fight soon began sheridan had become engaged in a spirited contest with stuart's cavalry on the left at todd's tavern in which our troops were completely victorious the sound of this conflict was mistaken for a time for an attack by longstreet from that direction and made hancock anxious to strengthen his exposed left flank his embarrassments were increased by one of those singular accidents which though trivial in themselves often turn the tide of battle a body of infantry was reported to be advancing up the brock road and moving upon hancock's left and rear 
a brigade which could ill be spared was at once thrown out in that direction to resist the threatening attack it soon appeared that the body of infantry consisted of about seven hundred of our convalescents who were returning to join their commands the incident however had caused the loss of valuable time these occurrences prevented hancock from further taking the offensive after waiting for some time and hearing nothing of burnside's contemplated assault i told hancock i would ride over to burnside explain to him fully the situation on the left and urge upon him the importance of making all possible haste upon reaching his position i found that he was meeting with many difficulties in moving his men into position and was making very little progress i explained the absolute necessity of going to the relief of hancock and colonel comstock and i labored vigorously to help to find some means of getting the troops through the woods seeing the difficulties in the way i returned to general grant to let him know the true situation and that an early attack from that quarter could not be depended upon warren's troops were driven back on a portion of his line in front of general headquarters stragglers were making their way to the rear the enemy's shells were beginning to fall on the knoll where general grant was seated on the stump of a tree and it looked for a while as if the tide of battle would sweep over that point of the field he rose slowly to his feet and stood for a time watching the scene and mingling the smoke of his cigar with the smoke of battle without making any comments his horse was in charge of an orderly just behind the hill but he evidently had no thought of mounting an officer ventured to remark to him general wouldn't it be prudent to move headquarters to the other side of the gamana road till the result of the present attack is known the general replied very quietly between the puffs of his cigar it strikes me it would be better to order up some artillery and defend the present location thereupon a battery was brought up and every preparation made for defence the enemy however was checked before he reached the knoll in this instance as in many others the general was true to the motto of his scottish ancestors of the grant clan stand fast craig Hilaki." about eleven o'clock the battle raged again with renewed fury on hancock's front he had been attacked in front and on the flank by a sudden advance of the enemy who concealed by the dense wood had approached near at several points before opening fire this caused some confusion among hancock's troops who had become in great measure exhausted by their fighting since five o'clock in the morning and they were now compelled to fall back to their breastworks along the brock road the enemy pressed on to within a few hundred yards of the entrenchments but did not venture to assault in this attack longstreet was badly wounded and the confederate general jenkins was killed both having been accidentally shot by their own men we suffered a severe loss in the death of the gallant general wadsworth after longstreet's removal from the field lee took command of his right in person as we learned afterward and ordered that any further assault should be postponed till a later hour colonel leisure's brigade of burnside's corps now executed a movement of striking brilliancy it had been sent to hancock and posted on the left of his line and was ordered by him to sweep along his front from left to right leisure moved out promptly facing to the right with his right flank about a hundred yards from our line of breastworks and dashed along the entire front with such boldness and audacity that the portions of the enemy he encountered fell back without attempting to make any serious resistance general grant was becoming more anxious still about burnside's attack and i soon after galloped over to the latter with instructions to move on without a moment's delay and connect with hancock's right at all hazards i found his troops endeavoring to obey orders as best they could but in struggling through underbrush and swamps all efforts to keep up their alignments were futile general burnside when i met him this time was dismounted and seated by the roadside a champagne basket filled with lunch had been brought up and at his invitation i joined him and some of his staff in sampling the attractive contents of the hamper in doing so we acted upon the recognized principle of experienced campaigners who always eat a meal wherever they can get it not knowing where the next one is to come from it was called eating for the future a little after noon burnside's advance became engaged for about a quarter of an hour but did not accomplish any important result 
i worked my way out on foot to his extreme front line at this time to obtain a more accurate knowledge of the difficulties which impeded the advance of his troops and then returned again to headquarters to report the situation about half the army was now under hancock's command and it was probable that he would need still more reinforcements and the general-in-chief was devoting a good deal of thought to our right which had been weakened at ten thirty a m sedgwick and warren had been ordered to entrench their fronts and do everything possible to strengthen their positions a portion of the wagon-train guards had been ordered to report to sedgwick for duty on his front every one on the right was on the alert and eager to hear particulars about the fighting on the left the various commands had been advised from time to time of the events which occurred for it was general grant's invariable custom to have commanding officers on different points of the line promptly informed of what occurred at other points generals grant and meade after discussing the situation now decided to have hancock and burnside make a simultaneous attack at six p m it was then supposed that burnside would certainly be in position by that hour to unite in such an assault i started for hancock's front to confer with him regarding this movement and just as i joined his troops the enemy directed by lee in person as we afterward discovered made a desperate assault upon our line it began at four fifteen p m the woods in front of hancock had now taken fire and the flames were communicated to his log breastworks and abatis of slashed timber the wind was unfortunately blowing in our direction and the blinding smoke was driven in the faces of our men while the fire itself swept down upon them for a time they battled heroically to maintain their position fighting both the conflagration and the enemy's advancing columns at last however the breastworks became untenable and some of the troops who had displayed such brilliant qualities during the entire day now fell back in confusion the enemy took advantage of the disorder and rushing forward with cheers succeeded in planting some of his battle flags upon our front line of breastworks but hancock and all the staff officers present made strenuous exertions to rally the men and many of them were soon brought back to the front general carroll's brigade was now ordered to form and retake the line of entrenchments which had been lost these gallant troops led by the intrepid carroll in person dashing forward at a run and cheering as they went swept everything before them and in a few minutes were in possession of the works both the attack and counter-attack were so handsomely made that they elicited praise from friend and foe alike some of hancock's artillery was served with great efficiency in this engagement and added much to the result at five o'clock the enemy had been completely repulsed and fell back leaving a large number of his dead and wounded on the field burnside made an attack at half-past five but with no important results the nature of the ground was a more formidable obstruction than the enemy warren and sedgwick had been engaged during part of the day and had prevented the enemy in front of them from withdrawing any troops but notwithstanding their gallant fighting they had substantially gained no ground while the most critical movements were taking place general grant manifested no perceptible anxiety but gave his orders and sent and received communications with a coolness and deliberation which made a marked impression upon those who had been brought into contact with him for the first time on the field of battle his speech was never hurried and his manner betrayed no trace of excitability or even impatience he never exhibited to better advantage his peculiar ability in moving troops with unparalleled speed to the critical points on the line of battle where they were most needed or as it was sometimes called feeding a fight there was a spur on the heel of every order he sent and his subordinates were made to realize that in battle it is the minutes which control events he said while waiting for burnside to get into position and attack the only time i ever feel impatient is when i give an order for an important movement of troops in the presence of the enemy and am waiting for them to reach their destination then the minutes seem like hours he rode out to important points of the line twice during the day in company with general meade and two officers of the staff it was noticed that he was visibly affected by his proximity to the wounded and especially by the sight of blood 
he would turn his face away from such scenes and show by the expression of his countenance and sometimes by a pause in his conversation that he felt most keenly the painful spectacle presented by the field of battle some reference was made to the subject in camp that evening and the general said i cannot bear the sight of suffering the night after the first day's fight at shiloh i was sitting on the ground leaning against a tree trying to get some sleep it soon began to rain so hard that i went into a log house near by to seek shelter but i found the surgeons had taken possession of it and were amputating the arms and legs of the wounded and blood was flowing in streams i could not endure such a scene and was glad to return to the tree outside and sit there till morning in the storm i thought of this remark while sitting by his bedside twenty-one years afterward when he in the last days of his fatal illness was himself undergoing supreme physical torture as the general felt that he could be found more readily and could issue his orders more promptly from the central point which he had chosen for his headquarters he remained there almost the entire day he would at times walk slowly up and down but most of the day he sat upon the stump of a tree or on the ground with his back leaning against a tree the thread gloves remained on his hands a lighted cigar was in his mouth almost constantly and his penknife was kept in active use whittling sticks he would pick up one small twig after another and sometimes holding the small end away from him would rapidly shave it down to a point at other times he would turn the point toward him and work on it as if sharpening a lead pencil then he would girdle it cut it in two throw it away and begin on another we had long been accused of being a nation of whittlers and this practice on the part of such a conspicuous representative american seemed to give color to the charge he seldom indulged in this habit in subsequent battles the occupation played sad havoc with the thread gloves and before nightfall several holes had been worn in them from which his fingernails protruded after that day the gloves disappeared and the general thereafter went without them in camp and wore the usual buckskin gauntlets when on horseback it was not till the appomattox campaign that another pair of thread gloves was donned there was a mystery about the use of these gloves which was never entirely solved the impression was that mrs grant had purchased them and handed them to the general before he started from washington and that either in deference to her or because he had a notion that the officers in the eastern armies were greater sticklers for dress than those in the armies of the west he wore the gloves continuously for the first three days of his opening campaign in virginia that is to say as long as they lasted under the wear and tear to which he subjected them his confidence was never for a moment shaken in the outcome of the general engagement in the wilderness and he never once doubted his ability to make a forward movement as the result of that battle at a critical period of the day he sent instructions to have all the pontoon bridges over the rapidan in his rear taken up except the one at Gamana ford a short time after giving this order he called general rawlins colonel babcock and me to him and asked for a map as we sat together on the ground his legs tucked under him tailor fashion he looked over the map and said i do not hope to gain any very decided advantage from the fighting in this forest i did expect excellent results from hancock's movement early this morning when he started the enemy on the run but it was impossible for him to see his own troops or the true position of the enemy and the success gained could not be followed up in such a country i can certainly drive lee back into his works but i shall not assault him there he would have all the advantage in such a fight if he falls back and entrenches my notion is to move promptly toward the left this will in all probability compel him to try and throw himself between us and richmond and in such a movement i hope to be able to attack him in a more open country and outside of his breastworks this was the second time only that he had looked at the maps since crossing the rapidan and it was always noticeable in a campaign how seldom he consulted them compared with the constant examination of them by most other prominent commanders the explanation of it is that he had an extraordinary memory as to anything that was presented to him graphically 
after looking critically at a map of a locality it seemed to become photographed indelibly upon his brain and he could follow its features without referring to it again besides he possessed an almost intuitive knowledge of topography and never became confused as to the points of the compass he was a natural bushwhacker and was never so much at home as when finding his way by the course of streams the contour of the hills and the general features of the country i asked him one day whether he had ever been deceived as to the points of the compass he said only once when i arrived at cairo illinois the effect of that curious bend in the river turned me completely around and when the sun came up the first morning after i got there it seemed to me that it rose directly in the west during a lull in the battle late in the afternoon general grant in company with two staff officers strolled over toward the germana road while we stood on the bank of a small rivulet a drove of beef cattle was driven past one of the animals strayed into the stream and had evidently made up its mind to part company with its fellows and come over to our side one of the drovers yelled out to the general who was a little in advance of his officers i say stranger head off that beef critter for me will ya the general having always prided himself upon being a practical farmer felt as much at home in handling cattle as in directing armies and without changing countenance at once stepped forward threw up his hands and shouted to the animal it stopped took a look at him and then as if sufficiently impressed with this show of authority turned back into the road the general made no comment whatever upon this incident and seemed to think no more about the salutation he had received than if some one had presented arms to him he knew of course that the man did not recognize him if he had supposed the man was lacking in proper military respect he would perhaps have administered to him the same lesson which he once taught a soldier in the twenty first illinois when he commanded that regiment an officer who had served under him at the time told me that colonel grant as he came out of his tent one morning found a strapping big fellow posted as sentinel who nodded his head good-naturedly smiled blandly and said howdy colonel his commander cried hand me your piece and upon taking it faced the soldier and came to a present arms then handing back the musket he remarked that is the way to say how do you do to your colonel it was now about sundown the storm of battle which had raged with unabated fury from early dawn had been succeeded by a calm the contemplated general attack at six o'clock had been abandoned on account of the assault of the enemy on hancock's front and the difficulty of perfecting the alignments and supplying the men with ammunition it was felt that the day's strife had ended unless lee should risk another attack just then the stillness was broken by heavy volleys of musketry on our extreme right which told that sedgwick had been assaulted and was actually engaged with the enemy the attack against which the general-in-chief during the day had ordered every precaution to be taken had now been made meade was at grant's headquarters at the time they had just left the top of the knoll and were standing in front of general grant's tent talking to mr washburn staff officers and couriers were soon sent galloping up to meade's headquarters and his chief of staff general humphreys sent word that the attack was directed against our extreme right and that a part of sedgwick's line had been driven back in some confusion generals grant and meade accompanied by me and one or two other staff officers walked rapidly over to meade's tent and found that the reports still coming in were bringing news of increasing disaster it was soon reported that general shaler and part of his brigade had been captured then that general seymour and several hundred of his men had fallen into the hands of the enemy afterward that our right had been turned and ferrero's division cut off and forced back upon the rapidan general humphreys on receiving the first reports had given prompt instructions with a view to strengthening the point of the line attacked general grant now took the matter in hand with his accustomed vigor darkness had set in but the firing still continued aides came galloping in from the right laboring under intense excitement talking wildly and giving the most exaggerated reports of the engagement some declared that a large force had broken and scattered sedgwick's entire corps others insisted that the enemy had turned our right completely and captured the wagon train 
it was asserted at one time that both sedgwick and wright had been captured such tales of disaster would have been enough to inspire serious apprehension in daylight and under ordinary circumstances in the darkness of the night in the gloom of a tangled forest and after men's nerves had been racked by the strain of a two days desperate battle the most immovable commander might have been shaken but it was in just such sudden emergencies that general grant was always at his best without the change of a muscle of his face or the slightest alteration in the tones of his voice he quietly interrogated the officers who brought the reports then sifting out the truth from the mass of exaggerations he gave directions for relieving the situation with the marvellous rapidity which was always characteristic of him when directing movements in the face of an enemy reinforcements were hurried to the point attacked and preparations made for sedgwick's corps to take up a new line with the front and right thrown back general grant soon walked over to his own camp seated himself on a stool in front of his tent lighted a fresh cigar and there continued to receive further advices from the right a general officer came in from his command at this juncture and said to the general-in-chief speaking rapidly and labouring under considerable excitement general grant this is a crisis that cannot be looked upon too seriously i know lee's methods well by past experience he will throw his whole army between us and the rapidan and cut us off completely from our communications the general rose to his feet took his cigar out of his mouth turned to the officer and replied with a degree of animation which he seldom manifested oh i am heartily tired of hearing about what lee is going to do some of you always seem to think he is suddenly going to turn a double somersault and land in our rear and on both of our flanks at the same time go back to your command and try to think what we are going to do ourselves instead of what lee is going to do the officer retired rather crestfallen and without saying a word in reply this recalls a very pertinent criticism regarding his chief once made in my presence by general sherman he said grant always seems pretty certain to win when he went into a fight with anything like equal numbers i believe the chief reason why he was more successful than others was that while they were thinking so much about what the enemy was going to do grant was thinking all the time about what he was going to do himself hancock came to headquarters about eight p m and had a conference with the general-in-chief and general meade he had had a very busy day on his front and while he was cheery and showed that there was still plenty of fight left in him he manifested signs of fatigue after his exhausting labors general grant in offering him a cigar found that only one was left in his pocket deducting the number he had given away from the supply he had started out with in the morning showed that he had smoked that day about twenty all very strong and of formidable size but it must be remembered that it was a particularly long day he never afterward equalled that record in the use of tobacco the general after having given his final orders providing for any emergency which might arise entered his tent and threw himself down upon his camp bed ten minutes thereafter an alarming report was received from the right i looked in his tent and found him sleeping as soundly and as peacefully as an infant i waked him and communicated the report his military instincts convinced him that it was a gross exaggeration and as he had already made every provision for meeting any renewed attempts against the right he turned over in his bed and immediately went to sleep again twenty-one years thereafter as i sat by his deathbed when his sufferings had become agonizing and he was racked by the tortures of insomnia i recalled to him that night in the wilderness he said ah yes it seems strange that i who always slept so well in the field should now pass whole nights in the quiet of this peaceful house without being able to close my eyes it was soon ascertained that although sedgwick's line had been forced back with some loss and shaler and seymour had been made prisoners only a few hundred men had been captured and the enemy had been compelled to withdraw general grant had great confidence in sedgwick in such an emergency and the event showed that it was not misplaced the attack on our right and its repulse ended the memorable battle of the wilderness the losses were found to be killed two thousand two hundred and forty six wounded twelve thousand thirty seven missing three thousand three hundred and eighty three total seventeen thousand six hundred and sixty six 
the damage inflicted upon the enemy is not known but as he was the assaulting party as often as the union army there is reason to believe that the losses on the two sides were about equal taking twenty-four hours as the time actually occupied in fighting and counting the casualties in both armies it will be found that on that bloody field every minute recorded the loss of twenty-five men as the staff officers threw themselves upon the ground that night sleep came to them without coaxing they had been on the move since dawn galloping over bad roads struggling about through forest openings jumping rivulets wading swamps helping to rally troops dodging bullets and searching for commanding officers in all sorts of unknown places their horses had been crippled and they themselves were well-nigh exhausted for the small part i had been able to perform in the engagement the general recommended me for the brevet rank of major in the regular army for gallant and meritorious services his recommendation was afterward approved by the president this promotion was especially gratifying for the reason that it was conferred for conduct in the first battle in which i had served under the command of the general-in-chief there were features of the battle which have never been matched in the annals of warfare for two days nearly two hundred thousand veteran troops had struggled in a death grapple confronted at each step with almost every obstacle by which nature could bar their path and groping their way through a tangled forest the impenetrable gloom of which could be likened only to the shadow of death the undergrowth stayed their progress the upper growth shut out the light of heaven officers could rarely see their troops for any considerable distance for smoke clouded the vision and a heavy sky obscured the sun directions were ascertained and lines established by means of the pocket compass and a change of position often presented an operation more like a problem of ocean navigation than a question of military manoeuvres it was the sense of sound and of touch rather than the sense of sight which guided the movements it was a battle fought with the ear and not with the eye all circumstances seemed to combine to make the scene one of unutterable horror at times the wind howled through the tree-tops mingling its moans with the groans of the dying and heavy branches were cut off by the fire of the artillery and fell crashing upon the heads of the men adding a new terror to battle forest fires raged ammunition trains exploded the dead were roasted in the conflagration the wounded roused by its hot breath dragged themselves along with their torn and mangled limbs in the mad energy of despair to escape the ravages of the flames and every bush seemed hung with shreds of blood-stained clothing it was as though christian men had turned to fiends and hell itself had usurped the place of earth End of chapter 4chapter five of campaigning with grant by horace porter this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five grant's third day in the wilderness hail to the chief a night alarm a midnight ride grant roughs it with his troops out of the wilderness sheridan ordered to crush jeb stuart a chapter of accidents grant in front of spotsylvania the death of sedgwick arrival of dispatches i shall take no backward steps the next morning may seven general grant was almost the first one up he seated himself at the campfire at dawn and looked thoroughly refreshed after the sound sleep he had enjoyed in fact a night's rest had greatly reinvigorated every one a fog combined with the smoke from the smouldering forest fires rendered it difficult for those of us who were sent to make reconnaissance to see any great distance even where there were openings in the forest a little after six a m there was some artillery firing from warren's batteries which created an impression for a little while that the enemy might be moving against him but he soon sent word that he had been firing at some skirmishers who had pushed down to a point near his entrenchments and discharged a few shots at six thirty a m the general issued his orders to prepare for a night march of the entire army toward spotsylvania courthouse on the direct road to richmond at eight thirty burnside pushed out a skirmishing party to feel the enemy and found that he had withdrawn from a portion of his line skirmishing continued along parts of warren's front till eleven a m 
in fact each army was anxious to learn promptly the position and apparent intentions of the other so as to be able to act intelligently in making the next move in the all-absorbing game the enemy was found to be occupying a strongly entrenched line defended by artillery and at an average distance from our front of nearly a mile while sitting at the mess table taking breakfast i asked the general-in-chief in all your battles up to this time where do you think your presence upon the field was most useful in the accomplishing of results he replied well i don't know then after a pause perhaps at shiloh i said i think it was last night when the attack was made on our right he did not follow up the subject for he always spoke with great reluctance about anything which was distinctly personal to himself the only way in which we could ever draw him out and induce him to talk about events in his military career was to make some misstatement intentionally about an occurrence his regard for truth was so great that his mind always rebelled against inaccuracies and in his desire to correct the error he would go into an explanation of the facts and in doing so would often be led to talk with freedom upon the subject an officer related to the general an incident of the attack the night before which showed that even the gravest events have a comical side in the efforts to strengthen our right a number of teamsters had been ordered into the ranks and sent hurriedly to the front as they were marching past their teams one of the men was recognized by his favorite lead mule who proceeded to pay his respects to him in a friendly hee-haw which reverberated through the forest until the sound bid fair to rival the report of the opening gun at lexington which fired the shot heard round the world the teamster turned to him and cried oh you better not laugh old simon bolivar before this fight's through i bet they'll pick you up and put you into the ranks too after leaving the breakfast table the general lighted a cigar and took his seat on a camp-stool in front of his tent in a conversation with the staff he then began to discuss the operations of the day before he expressed himself as satisfied with the result in the main saying while it is in one sense a drawn battle as neither side has gained or lost ground substantially since the fighting began yet we remain in possession of the field and the forces opposed to us have withdrawn to a distance from our front and taken up a defensive position we cannot call the engagement a positive victory but the enemy have only twice actually reached our lines in their many attacks and have not gained a single advantage this will enable me to carry out my intention of moving to the left and compelling the enemy to fight in a more open country and outside of their breastworks an old officer who was passing by an acquaintance of the general's now stepped up to the group he had recently been ordered in from the plains and his wild tales of red-handed slaughter in the land of the savages had already made him known in the army as the injun slayer an aide remarked to him well as you've been spoiling for a fight ever since you joined this army how did yesterday set to strike you by way of a skirmish oh was the reply you had large numbers engaged in heavy losses but it wasn't the picturesque desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting that you see when you're among the injuns no but we got in some pretty neat work on the white man said the aide yes but it didn't compare with the time the nez Perces and the shoshone tribes had their big battle continued the veteran why how was that cried all present in a chorus well you see explained the narrator first the nez Perces set up a yell louder than a blast of gabriel's trumpet and charged straight across the valley but the shoshone stood their ground without budging an inch and pretty soon they went for the nez Perces and drove them back again as soon as the nez Perces could catch their breath they took another turn at the shoshones and shoved them back just about where they started from by this time the ground between them was so covered by the killed and wounded that you couldn't see as much as a blade of grass but still they kept on charging back and forth across that valley and they moved so fast that when their lines of battle passed me the wind they made was so strong that i had to hold my hat on with both hands and once i came mighty near being blown clear off my feet why where were you all this time asked several voices oh said he i was standing on a little knoll in the middle of the valley looking on why remarked an officer i should think they would have killed you in the scrimmage then the face of the veteran of the plains assumed an air of offended innocence and in a tone of voice which made it painfully evident that he felt the hurt he said 
what the engines lord they all knew me the general joined in the smiles which followed this bit of sadly mutilated truth similar Munchausenisms indulged in from time to time by this officer demonstrated the fact that he had become so skilled in warping veracity that one of his lies could make truth look mean alongside of it and he finally grew so untrustworthy that it was unsafe even to believe the contrary of what he said at three p m dispatches were received by way of washington saying that general butler had reached the junction of the james and appomattox rivers the night of the fifth had surprised the enemy and successfully disembarked his troops and that sherman was moving out against johnston in georgia and expected that a battle would be fought on the seventh all preparation for the night march had now been completed the wagon trains were to move at four p m so as to get a start of the infantry and then go into park and let the troops pass them the cavalry had been thrown out in advance the infantry began the march at eight thirty p m warren was to proceed along the brock road toward spotsylvania court house moving by the rear of hancock whose corps was to remain in its position during the night to guard against a possible attack by the enemy and afterward to follow warren sedgwick was to move by way of chancellorsville and piney branch church burnside was to follow sedgwick and to cover the trains which moved on the roads that were farthest from the enemy soon after dark generals grant and meade accompanied by their staffs after having given personal supervision to the starting of the march rode along the brock road toward hancock's headquarters with the intention of waiting there till warren's troops should reach that point while moving close to hancock's line there occurred an unexpected demonstration on the part of the troops which created one of the most memorable scenes of the campaign notwithstanding the darkness of the night the form of the commander was recognized and word was passed rapidly along that the chief who had led them through the mazes of the wilderness was again moving forward with his horse's head turned toward richmond troops know but little about what is going on in a large army except the occurrences which take place in their immediate vicinity but this night ride of the general-in-chief told plainly the story of success and gave each man to understand that the cry was to be on to richmond soldiers weary and sleepy after their long battle with stiffened limbs and smarting wounds now sprang to their feet forgetful of their pains and rushed forward to the roadside wild cheers echoed through the forest and glad shouts of triumph rent the air men swung their hats tossed up their arms and pressed forward to within touch of their chief clapping their hands and speaking to him with the familiarity of comrades pine knots and leaves were set on fire and lighted the scene with their weird flickering glare the night march had become a triumphal procession for the new commander the demonstration was the emphatic verdict pronounced by the troops upon his first battle in the east the excitement had been imparted to the horses which soon became restive and even the general's large bay over which he possessed ordinarily such perfect control became difficult to manage instead of being elated by this significant ovation the general thoughtful only of the practical question of the success of the movement said this is most unfortunate the sound will reach the ears of the enemy and i fear it may reveal our movement by his direction staff officers rode forward and urged the men to keep quiet so as not to attract the enemy's attention but the demonstration did not really cease until the general was out of sight when hancock's headquarters were reached the party remained with him for some time awaiting the arrival of the head of warren's troops hancock's wound received at gettysburg had not thoroughly healed and he suffered such inconvenience from it when in the saddle that he had applied for permission to ride in a spring ambulance while on the march and when his troops were not in action he was reclining upon one of the seats of the ambulance conversing with general grant who had dismounted and was sitting on the ground with his back against a tree whittling a stick when the sound of firing broke forth directly in front hancock sprang up seized his sword which was lying near him buckled it around his waist and cried my horse my horse the scene was intensely dramatic and recalled vividly to the bystanders the cry of richard the third on the field of bosworth 
grant listened a moment without changing his position or ceasing his whittling and then remarked they are not fighting the firing is all on one side it takes two sides to start a fight in a few minutes the firing died away and it was found that the enemy was not advancing the incident fairly illustrates the contrast in the temperaments of these two distinguished soldiers at eleven o'clock word came to grant and meade that their headquarters escorts and wagons were delaying the advance of warren's corps and they decided to move on to todd's tavern in order to clear the way the woods were still on fire along parts of the main road which made it almost impassable so that the party turned to the right along a side road the intention was to take the same route by which the cavalry had advanced but it was difficult to tell one road from another the night was dark the dust was thick the guide who was directing the party became confused and it was uncertain whether we were riding in the right direction or riding into the lines of the enemy the guide was for a time suspected of treachery but he was innocent of such a charge and had only lost his bearings colonel comstock rode on in advance and hearing the sound of marching columns not far off on our right came back with this news that it was decided to return to the brock road general grant at first demurred when it was proposed to turn back and urged the guide to try and find some cross road leading to the brock road to avoid retracing our steps this was an instance of his marked aversion to turning back which amounted almost to a superstition he often put himself to the greatest personal inconvenience to avoid it when he found he was not travelling in the direction he intended to take he would try all sorts of cross-cuts ford streams and jump any number of fences to reach another road rather than go back and take a fresh start if he had been in the place of the famous apprentice boy who wandered away from london he would never have been thrice mayor of that city for with him bow bells would have appealed to deaf ears when they chimed out turn again whittington the enemy who encountered him never failed to feel the effect of this inborn prejudice against turning back however a slight retrograde movement became absolutely necessary in the present instance and the general yielded to the force of circumstances an orderly was stationed at the fork of the roads to indicate the right direction to warren's troops when they should reach that point and our party proceeded to todd's tavern reaching there soon after midnight it was learned afterward that anderson's longstreet's corps had been marching parallel with us and at a distance of less than a mile so that the apprehension felt was well founded the general and staff bivouacked upon the ground the night was quite chilly and a couple of fires were lighted to add to our comfort general grant lay down with his officers beside one of the fires without any covering when asleep an aide quietly spread an overcoat over him for about four hours we all kept turning over every few minutes so as to get warmed on both sides imitating with our bodies the diurnal motion of the earth as it exposes its sides alternately to the heat of the sun when daylight broke it was seen that a low board structure close to which the general-in-chief had lain down was a pig-pen but its former occupants had disappeared and were probably at that time nourishing the stomachs of the cavalry troopers of the invading army unfortunately the odours of the place had not taken their departure with the pigs but remained to add to the discomfort of the bivouackers sheridan's cavalry had had a fight at this place the afternoon before in which he had defeated the opposing force and the ground in the vicinity strewn with the dead offered ample evidence of the severity of the struggle at daylight on the morning of the eighth active operations were in progress throughout the columns general sheridan had ordered his cavalry to move by different roads to seize the bridges crossing the po river general meade modified these orders and directed a portion of the cavalry to move in front of warren's infantry on the spotsylvania courthouse road the enemy were felling trees and placing other obstacles in the way in order to impede the movement and the cavalry was afterward withdrawn and the infantry directed to open the way about sunrise general grant after taking off his coat and shaking it to rid it of some of the dust in which he had lain down shared with the staff officers some soldiers rations and then seated himself on the ground by the roadside to take his morning smoke 
soon afterward he and general meade rode on and established their respective headquarters near piney branch church about two miles to the east of todd's tavern it was sunday but the overrunning of the country by contending armies had scattered the little church's congregation the temple of prayer was voiceless the tolling of its peaceful bell had given place to the echo of hostile guns and in the excitement which prevailed it must be confessed that few recalled the fact that it was the sabbath day a drum corps in passing caught sight of the general and at once struck up a then popular negro camp meeting air every one began to laugh and rawlins cried good for the drummers what's the fun inquired the general why was the reply they are playing ain't a glad to get out of de wilderness the general smiled at the ready wit of the musicians and said well with me a musical joke always requires explanation i only know two tunes one is yankee doodle and the other isn't charles a dana assistant secretary of war joined us during the afternoon coming from washington by way of rappahannock station and remained at headquarters most of the time through the entire campaign his daily and sometimes hourly dispatches to the war department giving the events occurring in the field constituted a correspondence which is a rare example of perspicuity accuracy and vividness of description sheridan had been sent for by meade to come to his headquarters and when he arrived between eleven and twelve o'clock that morning a very acrimonious dispute took place between the two generals meade was possessed of an excitable temper which under irritating circumstances became almost ungovernable he had worked himself into a towering passion regarding the delays encountered in the forward movement and when sheridan appeared went at him hammer and tongs accusing him of blunders and charging him with not making a proper disposition of his troops and letting the cavalry block the advance of the infantry sheridan was equally fiery and smarting under the belief that he was unjustly treated all the hot spur in his nature was aroused he insisted that meade had created the trouble by countermanding his sheridan's orders and that it was this fact which had resulted in mixing up his troops with the infantry exposing to great danger wilson's division which had advanced as far as spotsylvania courthouse and rendering ineffectual all his combinations regarding the movements of the cavalry corps sheridan declared with great warmth that he would not command the cavalry any longer under such conditions and said if he could have matters his own way he would concentrate all the cavalry move out in force against stuart's command and whip it his language throughout was highly spiced and conspicuously italicized with expletives general meade came over to general grant's tent immediately after and related the interview to him the excitement of the one was in singular contrast with the calmness of the other when meade repeated the remarks made by sheridan that he could move out with his cavalry and whip stuart general grant quietly observed did sheridan say that well he generally knows what he's talking about let him start right out and do it by one o'clock sheridan had received his orders in writing from meade for the movement early the next morning he started upon his famous raid to the vicinity of richmond in rear of the enemy's army and made good his word after the interview just mentioned the general-in-chief talked for some time with officers of the staff about the results of the battle of the previous days he said in this connection all things in this world are relative while we were engaged in the wilderness i could not keep from thinking of the first fight i ever saw the battle of palo alto as i looked at the long line of battle consisting of three thousand men i felt that general taylor had such a fearful responsibility resting upon him that i wondered how he ever had the nerve to assume it and when after the fight the casualties were reported and the losses ascertained to be nearly sixty in killed wounded and missing the engagement assumed a magnitude in my eyes which was positively startling when the news of the victory reached the states the windows in every household were illuminated and it was largely instrumental in making general taylor president of the united states now such an affair would scarcely be deemed important enough to report to headquarters he little thought at that moment that the battles then in progress would be chiefly instrumental in making the commander himself president of the united states
the movements of the opposing armies now became one of the most instructive lessons in the art of modern warfare they showed the closeness of the game played by the two great masters who commanded the contending forces and illustrated how thoroughly those skilled fencers had carta and tierce at their fingers ends they demonstrated also how far the features of a campaign may be affected by accidents and errors in the wilderness the manoeuvres had been largely a game of blind man's buff they now became more like the play of pussy wants a corner anderson had been ordered by lee on the evening of may seven to start for spotsylvania courthouse the next morning but anderson finding the woods on fire and no good place to go into camp kept his troops in motion continued his march all night and reached spotsylvania in the morning the cavalry which sheridan had placed at the bridges over the po river might have greatly impeded anderson's march but owing to conflicting orders the movements of the cavalry had been changed and anderson occupied a position at spotsylvania that morning as the result of a series of accidents when lee found our wagon trains were moving in an easterly direction he made up his mind that our army was retreating and telegraphed on the eighth to his government at richmond the enemy has abandoned his position and is moving toward fredericksburg he sent an order the same day to early then commanding hill's corps saying move by todd's tavern along the brock road as soon as your front is clear of the enemy it will be seen that in this order he directed a corps to move by a road which was then in full possession of our forces and early did not discover this fact till he actually encountered hancock's troop at todd's tavern early was then compelled to take another road it was after these movements that general grant uttered the aphorism accident often decides the fate of battle at eleven thirty a m general grant sent a telegram to halleck saying the best of feeling prevails route to the james river not yet definitely marked out in talking over the situation at headquarters he said it looks somewhat as if lee intends to throw his army between us and fredericksburg in order to cut us off from our base of supplies i would not be at all sorry to have such a move made as in that case i would be in rear of lee and between him and richmond that morning may eighth the troops under warren encountered those of anderson's corps who were entrenched near spotsylvania warren attacked but was not able to make much progress and decided to strengthen his own position and wait until other troops came to his assistance before giving battle his men had suffered great hardships they had been under fire for four days and had just made a long night march to reach their present position late in the afternoon warren and sedgwick were ordered to attack with all their forces but it was nearly dark before the assault could be made and then only half of sedgwick's command and but one of warren's divisions participated there was no decided result from this day's fighting late in the afternoon of the eighth headquarters were moved south about two miles and camp was pitched in the angle formed by the intersection of the brock road with the road running south from priney branch church lee had by this time comprehended grant's intentions and was making all haste to throw his troops between the union army and richmond and take up a strong defensive position most of the officers of the staff had been in the saddle since daylight communicating with the corps commanders designating the lines of march and urging forward the troops and as soon as the tents were pitched that night all who could be spared for a while from duty turned in to catch as many winks of sleep as possible every one at headquarters was up at daylight the next morning prepared for another active day's work hancock was now on the right warren next then sedgwick burnside was moving down to go into position on the extreme left the general expressed his intention to devote the day principally to placing all the troops in position reconnoitering the enemy's line and getting in readiness for a combined attack as soon as proper preparations for it could be made the country was more open than the wilderness but it still presented obstacles of a most formidable nature four rivers ran in a southeasterly direction some early pioneer ingenious in systematic nomenclature and who was evidently possessed of a due regard for helps to human memory had named the streams respectively beginning with the most southerly the mat the taw the po and the nye and then deployed these terms in single line 
closing them in until they were given a touch of the elbow and called the formation the mataponi the name by which the large river is known into which the four smaller ones flow spotsylvania courthouse lies between the po and the nye while these streams are not wide their banks are steep in some places and lined by marshes in other the country is undulating and was at that time broken by alternations of cleared spaces and dense forests in the woods there was a thick tangled undergrowth of hazel dwarf pine and scrub oak a little before eight o'clock on the morning of may nine the general mounted his horse and directed me and two other staff officers to accompany him to make an examination of the lines in our immediate front this day he rode a black pony called jeff davis given that name because it had been captured in mississippi on the plantation of joe davis a brother of the confederate president it was turned into the quartermaster's department from which it was purchased by the general on his vicksburg campaign he was not well at that time being afflicted with boils and he took a fancy to the pony because it had a remarkably easy pace which enabled the general to make his long daily rides with much more comfort than when he used the horses he usually rode little jeff soon became a conspicuous figure in the virginia campaign we proceeded to sedgwick's command and the general had a conference with him in regard to the part his corps was to take in the contemplated attack both officers remained mounted during the interview the gallant commander of the famous sixth corps seemed particularly cheerful and hopeful that morning and looked the picture of buoyant life and vigorous health when his chief uttered some words of compliment upon his recent services and spoke of the hardships he had encountered sedgwick spoke lightly of the difficulties experienced and expressed every confidence in the ability of his troops to respond heroically to every demand made upon them when the general-in-chief left him sedgwick started with his staff to move farther to the front our party had ridden but a short distance to the left when general grant sent me back to sedgwick to discuss with him further a matter which it was thought had not been sufficiently emphasized in their conversation while i was following the road i had seen him take i heard musketry firing ahead and soon saw the body of an officer being borne from the field such a sight was so common that ordinarily it would have attracted no attention but my apprehensions were aroused by seeing several of general sedgwick's staff beside the body as they came nearer i gave an inquiring look colonel beaumont of the staff cast his eyes in the direction of the body then looked at me with an expression of profound sorrow and slowly shook his head his actions told the whole sad story his heroic chief was dead i was informed that as he was approaching an exposed point of the line to examine the enemy's position more closely general mcmahon of his staff reminded him that one or two officers had just been struck at that spot by sharpshooters and begged him not to advance farther at this suggestion the general only smiled and soon after had entirely forgotten the warning indifferent to every form of danger such an appeal made but little impression upon him his movements led him to the position against which he had been cautioned and he had scarcely dismounted and reached the spot on foot when a bullet entered his left cheek just below the eye and he fell dead as his lifeless form was carried by a smile still remained upon his lips sedgwick was essentially a soldier he had never married the camp was his home and the members of his staff were his family he was always spoken of familiarly as uncle john and the news of his death fell upon his comrades with a sense of grief akin to the sorrow of a personal bereavement i rode off at once to bear the sad intelligence to the general-in-chief for a few moments he could scarcely realize it and twice asked is he really dead the shock was severe and he could ill conceal the depth of his grief he said his loss to this army is greater than the loss of a whole division of troops general wright was at once placed in command of the sixth corps at daylight on may nine burnside had moved down the road from fredericksburg crossed the nye driven back a force of the enemy and finally reached a position within less than two miles of spotsylvania by noon it was found that the confederate army occupied an almost continuous line in front of spotsylvania in the form of a semicircle with the convex side facing north 
the demonstrations made by lee and the strengthening of his right revived in general grant's mind the impression that the enemy might attempt to work around our left and interpose between us and fredericksburg and preparations were made in such case to attack lee's left turn it and throw the union army between him and richmond at noon a package of dispatches from washington reached headquarters and were eagerly read they announced that sherman's columns were moving successfully in northwestern georgia that resaca was threatened and that joe johnston was steadily retreating a report from butler dated the fifth stated that he had landed at city point and reports of the sixth and seventh announced that he had sent out reconnoitering parties on the petersburg railroad and had dispatched troops to take possession of it that he had had some hard fighting and was then entrenching and wanted reinforcements general grant directed the reinforcements to be sent Siegel reported that he had not yet met the enemy and expected to move up the shenandoah valley and try to connect with crook general grant did not express any particular gratification regarding these reports except the one from sherman and in fact made very few comments upon them hancock had crossed the po and was now threatening lee's left on the morning of the tenth hancock found the enemy's line strongly entrenched and no general attack was made upon it lee had realized the danger threatened and had hurried troops to his left to protect that flank grant perceiving this decided that lee must have weakened other portions of his line and at once determined to assault his centre at nine thirty a m the general-in-chief sat down in his tent at his little camp-table and wrote with his own hand as usual a dispatch to halleck which began as follows the enemy hold our front in very strong force and evince a strong determination to interpose between us and richmond to the last i shall take no backward steps the last sentence which i have italicized attracted no notice at the time on the part of those who read it but it afterward became historic and took a prominent place among the general's famous sayings it was now suggested to him that it would be more convenient to move our camp farther to the left so as to be near the centre where the assault was to take place and orders were given to establish it a little more than a mile to the southeast near the alsop house the tents were pitched in a comfortable-looking little dell on the edge of a deep wood and near the principal roads of communication End of chapter five Chapter Six of Campaigning with Grant by Horace Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six, Communicating with Burnside. Grant attacks the enemy's center. How a famous message was dispatched. News from the other armies. Preparing to attack the angle. An eventful morning at headquarters. Two distinguished prisoners. How the angle was captured. Scenes at the bloody angle at half past ten on the morning of may ten the general-in-chief called me to where he was standing in front of his tent spoke in much detail of what he wanted burnside to accomplish and directed me to go to that officer explain to him fully the situation and the wishes of the commander and remain with him on the left during the rest of the day as i was mounting the general added i had started to write a note to burnside just wait a moment and i'll finish it and you can deliver it to him he stepped into his tent and returned in a few minutes and handed me the note i set out at once at a gallop toward our left there were two roads by which burnside could be reached one was a circuitous route some distance in rear of our lines the other was much shorter but under the enemy's fire for quite a distance the latter was chosen on account of the time which would thereby be saved when the exposed part of the road was reached i adopted the method to which aides so often resorted when they had to take the chances of getting through with a message and when those chances were not particularly promising putting the horse on a run and throwing the body down along his neck on the opposite side from the enemy although the bullets did considerable execution in clipping the limbs of the trees and stirring up the earth they were considerate enough to skip me the horse was struck but only slightly and i succeeded in reaching burnside rather ahead of scheduled time his headquarters had been established on the north side of the river nye 
i explained to him that a general attack was about to be made in the afternoon on the enemy's centre by warren's and hancock's troops and that he was to move forward for the purpose of reconnoitring lee's extreme right and keeping him from detaching troops from his flanks to reinforce his centre if burnside could see a chance to attack he was to do so with all vigour and in a general way make the best cooperative effort that was possible a little while before the heroic stevenson commander of his first division had been struck by a sharpshooter and killed he had served with burnside in the north carolina expedition and the general was much attached to him he felt his loss keenly and was profuse in his expressions of grief the forward movement was ordered at once burnside was in great doubt as to whether he should concentrate his three divisions and attack the enemy's right vigorously or demonstrate with two divisions and place the third in rear of mott who was on his right i felt sure that general grant would prefer the former and urged it strenuously but burnside was so anxious to have general grant make a decision in the matter himself that he sent him a note at two fifteen p m he did not get an answer for nearly two hours the general said in his reply that it was then too late to bring up the third division and he thought that burnside would be secure in attacking as he was i had ridden with general burnside to the front to watch the movement the advance soon reached a point within a quarter of a mile of spotsylvania and completely turned the right of the enemy's line but the country was so bewildering and the enemy so completely concealed from view that it was impossible at the time to know the exact relative positions of the contending forces toward dark wilcox's division had constructed a line of fence-rail breastworks and held pretty securely his advanced position i had sent two bulletins to general grant describing the situation on the left but the orderly who carried one of the dispatches never arrived having probably been killed and the other did not reach the general till quite late as he was riding among the troops in front of the centre of the line and it was difficult to find him i started for headquarters that evening but owing to the intense darkness the condition of the roads and the difficulty of finding the way did not arrive till long after midnight the same day may ten had witnessed important fighting on the right and centre of our line hancock moved his troops back to the north side of the po barlow's division while withdrawing became isolated and was twice assaulted but each time repulsed the enemy the losses on both sides were heavy wright had formed an assaulting force of twelve regiments and placed colonel emory upton in command at four p m wright warren and mott moved their commands forward and a fierce struggle ensued warren was repulsed with severe loss and mott's attack failed but upton's column swept through the enemy's line carrying everything before it and capturing several guns and a number of prisoners unfortunately the troops ordered to his support were so slow in reaching him that he had to be withdrawn the men had behaved so handsomely however and manifested such a desire to retake the position that general grant had additional troops brought up and ordered another assault again a rush was made upon the enemy's line and again the same gallantry was shown many of our men succeeded in getting over the earthworks but could not secure a lodgment which could be held and as the assaults at other points were not made with the dash and spirit exhibited by upton his troops were withdrawn after nightfall to a position of greater security in which they would not be isolated from the rest of the forces he was compelled to abandon his captured guns but he brought away all his prisoners upton had been severely wounded general grant had obtained permission of the government before starting from washington to promote officers on the field for conspicuous acts of gallantry and he now conferred upon upton the well-merited grade of brigadier-general colonel samuel s carroll was also promoted to the rank of brigadier-general for gallantry displayed by him in this action lee had learned by this time that he must be on the lookout for an attack from grant at any hour day or night he sent ewell a message on the evening of the tenth saying it will be necessary for you to re-establish your whole line to-night perhaps grant will make a night attack as it was a favorite amusement of his at vicksburg 
while the general in chief was out on the line supervising the afternoon attack he dismounted and sat down on a fallen tree to write a dispatch while thus engaged a shell exploded directly in front of him he looked up from his paper an instant and then without the slightest change of countenance went on writing the message some of the fifth wisconsin wounded were being carried past him at the time and major e r jones of that regiment said and he mentions it in his interesting book of reminiscences published since that one of his men made the remark ulysses don't scare worth a damn the eleventh of may gave promise of a little rest for everybody as the commander expressed his intention to spend the day simply in reconnoitring for the purpose of learning more about the character and strength of the enemy's entrenchments and discovering the weakest points in his line with a view to breaking through he sat down at the mess table that morning and made his entire breakfast off a cup of coffee and a small piece of beef cooked almost to a crisp for the cook had by this time learned that the nearer he came to burning up the beef the better the general liked it during the short time he was at the table he conversed with mr elihu b washburn who had accompanied headquarters up to this time and who was now about to return to washington after breakfast the general lighted a cigar seated himself on a camp chair in front of his tent and was joined there by mr washburn and several members of the staff at half-past eight o'clock the cavalry escort which was to accompany the congressman was drawn up in the road near by and all present rose to bid him good-bye turning to the chief he said general i shall go to see the president and the secretary of war as soon as i reach washington i can imagine their anxiety to know what you think of the prospects of the campaign and i know they would be greatly gratified if i could carry a message from you giving what encouragement you can as to the situation the general hesitated a moment and then replied we are certainly making fair progress and all the fighting has been in our favor but the campaign promises to be a long one and i am particularly anxious not to say anything just now that might hold out false hopes to the people and then after a pause added however i will write a letter to halleck as i generally communicate through him giving the general situation and you can take it with you he stepped into his tent sat down at his field table and keeping his cigar in his mouth wrote a dispatch of about two hundred words in the middle of the communication occurred the famous words i propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer when the letter had been copied he folded it and handed it to mr washburn who thanked him warmly wished him a continuation of success shook hands with him and with each of the members of the staff and at once mounted his horse and rode off the staff officers read the retained copy of the dispatch but neither the general himself nor any one at headquarters realized the epigrammatic character of the striking sentence it contained until the new york papers reached camp a few days afterward with the words displayed in large headlines and with conspicuous comments upon the force of the expression it was learned afterward that the president was delighted to read this dispatch giving such full information as to the situation and that he had said a few days before when asked by a member of congress what grant was doing well i can't tell much about it you see grant has gone to the wilderness crawled in drawn up the ladder and pulled in the hole after him and i guess we'll have to wait till he comes out before we know just what he's up to the general was now awaiting news from butler and sheridan with some anxiety while maturing his plans for striking lee he was at the same time keeping a close lookout to see that lee was not detaching any troops with the purpose of crushing butler's or sheridan's forces this day may eleven the looked-for dispatches arrived and their contents caused no little excitement at headquarters the general after glancing over the reports hurriedly stepped to the front of his tent and read them aloud to the staff officers who had gathered about him eager to learn the news from the cooperating armies butler reported that he had a strongly entrenched position at bermuda hundred in the angle formed by the james and appomattox rivers that he had cut the railroad leaving beauregard's troops south of the break and had completely whipped hill's force sheridan sent word that he had torn up ten miles of the virginia central railroad between lee's army and richmond and had destroyed a large quantity of medical supplies and a million and a half of rations 
the general-in-chief expressed himself as particularly pleased with the destruction of the railroad in rear of lee as it would increase the difficulty of moving troops suddenly between richmond and spotsylvania for the purpose of reinforcing either of those points as usual the contents of these dispatches were promptly communicated to generals meade and burnside the result of the day's work on our front was to discover more definitely the character of the salient in lee's defences on the right of his centre it was in the shape of a v with a flattened apex the ground in front sloped down toward our position and was in most places thickly wooded there was a clearing however about four hundred yards in width immediately in front of the apex several of the staff officers were on that part of the field a great portion of the day at three o'clock in the afternoon the general had thoroughly matured his plans and sent instructions to meade directing him to move hancock with all possible secrecy under cover of night to the left of right and to make a vigorous assault on the angle at dawn the next morning warren and wright were ordered to hold their corps as close to the enemy as possible and to take advantage of any diversion caused by this attack to push in if an opportunity should present itself a personal conference was held with the three corps commanders and every effort made to have a perfect understanding on their part as to exactly what was required in this important movement colonels comstock and babcock were directed to go to burnside that afternoon and to remain with him during the movements of the next day in which he was to attack simultaneously with hancock the other members of the staff were sent to keep in communication with the different portions of hancock's line the threatening sky was not propitious for the movement but in this entertainment there was to be no postponement on account of the weather and the preparations went on regardless of the lowering clouds and falling rain all those who were in the secret anticipated a memorable field day on the morrow hancock's troops made a difficult night march groping their way through the gloom of the forest their clothing drenched with rain and their feet ankle deep in virginia mud a little after midnight they reached their position and formed for the attack at a distance of about twelve hundred yards from the enemy's entrenchments i had been out all night looking after the movements of the troops which were to form the assaulting columns after they had all been placed in position i started for headquarters in obedience to instructions to report the situation to the general-in-chief he counted upon important results from the movement although he appreciated fully the difficulties to be encountered and was naturally anxious about the dispositions which were being made for the attack the condition of the country was such that a horseman could make but slow progress in moving from one point of the field to another the rain was falling in torrents the ground was marshy the roads were narrow and the movements of the infantry and artillery had churned up the mud until the country was almost impassable in the pitchy darkness one's horse constantly ran against trees was shoved off the road by guns or wagons and had to squeeze through lines of infantry who swore like our army in flanders when a staff officer's horse manifested a disposition to crawl over them by feeling the way for some hours i reached headquarters about daylight the next morning may twelve when i arrived the general was up and sitting wrapped in his overcoat close to a camp-fire which was struggling heroically to sustain its life against the assaults of wind and rain it had been decided to move headquarters a little nearer to the centre of the lines and most of the camp equipage had been packed up ready to start the general seemed in excellent spirits and was even inclined to be jocose he said to me we have just had our coffee and you will find some left for you and then taking a critical look at my drenched and bespattered clothes and famished appearance added but perhaps you are not hungry to disabuse the chief's mind on this score i sent for a cup of coffee and drank it with the relish of a shipwrecked mariner while i related the incidents of the embarrassments encountered in hancock's movement and the position he had taken up before i had quite finished making my report the stillness was suddenly broken by artillery firing which came from the direction of burnside's position a few minutes after came the sound of cheers and the rattle of musketry from hancock's front telling that the main assault upon the angle had begun no one could see a hundred yards from our position on account of the dense woods and reports from the front were eagerly awaited it was nearly an hour before anything definite was received 
but at five thirty an officer came galloping through the woods with a report from hancock saying he had captured the first line of the enemy's works this officer was closely followed by another who reported that many prisoners had been taken fifteen minutes later came the announcement that hancock had captured two general officers general grant sent burnside this news with a message saying push on with all vigor wright's corps was now ordered to attack on the right of hancock before six o'clock a message from hancock's headquarters reported the capture of two thousand prisoners and a quarter of an hour later burnside sent word that he had driven the enemy back two miles and a half in his front hancock called for reinforcements but grant had anticipated him and had already ordered troops to his support the scene at headquarters was now exciting in the extreme as aides galloped up one after the other in quick succession with stirring bulletins all bearing the glad tidings of overwhelming success the group of staff officers standing about the camp-fire interrupted their active work of receiving receipting for and answering dispatches by shouts and cheers which made the forest ring general grant sat unmoved upon his camp chair giving his constant thoughts to devising methods for making the victory complete at times the smoke from the struggling camp-fire would for a moment blind him and occasionally a gust of wind would blow the cape of his greatcoat over his face and cut off his voice in the middle of a sentence only once during the scene he rose from his seat and paced up and down for about ten minutes he made very few comments upon the stirring events which were crowding so closely upon one another until the reports came in regarding the prisoners when the large numbers captured were announced he said with the first trace of animation he had shown that's the kind of news i like to hear i had hoped that a bold dash at daylight would secure a large number of prisoners hancock is doing well this remark was eminently characteristic of the union commander his extreme fondness for taking prisoners was manifested in every battle he fought when word was brought to him of a success on any part of the line his first and most eager question was always have any prisoners been taken the love for capturing prisoners amounted to a passion with him it did not seem to arise from the fact that they added so largely to the trophies of battle and was no doubt chiefly due to his tenderness of heart which prompted him to feel that it was always more humane to reduce the enemy's strength by captures than by slaughter his desire in this respect was amply gratified for during the war it fell to his lot to capture a larger number of prisoners than any general of modern times meade had come over to grant's headquarters early and while they were engaged in discussing the situation about six thirty a m a horseman rode up wearing the uniform of a confederate general halting near the camp-fire he dismounted and walked forward saluting the group of union officers as he approached his clothing was covered with mud and a hole had been torn in the crown of his felt hat through which a tuft of hair protruded looking like a sioux chief's warlock meade looked at him attentively for a moment and then stepped up to him grasped him cordially by the hand and cried why how do you do general and then turned to the general-in-chief and said general grant this is general johnson edward johnson general grant shook hands warmly with a distinguished prisoner and exclaimed how do you do it is a long time since we last met yes replied johnson it is a great many years and i had not expected to meet you under such circumstances it is one of the many sad fortunes of war answered general grant who offered the captured officer a cigar and then picked up a camp chair placed it with his own hands near the fire and added be seated and we will do all in our power to make you as comfortable as possible johnson sat down and said in a voice and with a manner which showed that he was deeply touched by these manifestations of courtesy thank you general thank you you are very kind he had been in the corps of cadets with general meade and had served in the mexican war with general grant but they probably would not have recognized him if they had not already heard that he had been made a prisoner i had known johnson very well and it was only four years since i had seen him we recognized each other at once and i extended a cordial greeting to him and presented the members of our staff he was soon quite at his ease and bore himself under the trying circumstances in a manner which commanded the respect of every one present general hancock had already provided him with a horse to make his trip to the rear with the rest of the prisoners as comfortably as possible
after some pleasant conversation with grant and meade about old times and the strange chances of war he bade us good-bye and started under escort for our base of supplies general george h stuart was also captured but was not sent in to general headquarters on account of a scene which had been brought about by an unseemly exhibition of temper on his part hancock had known him in the old army and in his usual frank way went up to him greeted him kindly and offered his hand stuart drew back rejected the offer and said rather haughtily under the present circumstances i must decline to take your hand hancock who was somewhat nettled by this remark replied under any other circumstances general i should not have offered it no further attempt was made to extend any courtesies to his prisoner who was left to make his way to the rear on foot with the others who had been captured while generals grant and meade were talking with general johnson by the campfire a dispatch came in from hancock saying i have finished up johnson and am now going into early general grant passed this dispatch around but did not read it aloud as usual out of consideration for johnson's feelings soon after came another report that hancock had taken three thousand prisoners then another that he had turned his captured guns upon the enemy and made a whole division prisoners including the famous stonewall brigade burnside now reported that his right had lost its connection with hancock's corps general grant sent him a brief characteristic note in reply saying push the enemy with all your might that's the way to connect the general-in-chief showed again upon that eventful morning the value he placed upon minutes aides were kept riding at a full run carrying messages and the terseness vigor and intensity manifested in every line of his field orders were enough to spur the most sluggish to prompt action after giving such instructions as would provide for the present emergencies the general ordered the pony jeff davis to be saddled and started for the front he left an adjutant general behind with orders to forward to him promptly all communications the staff rode with the general and after a while reached a clearing on a piece of elevated ground from which a view of portions of the line could be obtained it was found upon learning the details of the assault upon the angle that notwithstanding the fatigues and hardships to which the troops had been subjected they had moved forward with the step of veterans and had marched halfway across the open ground which separated them from the well-defended earthworks in their front with a steady pace and unbroken alignment at that point they sent up cheers which rent the air and the columns dashed forward at a run scattering the enemy's pickets before them in their swift advance a brisk fire was opened by the confederate line from a position to the left but unheeding it and without firing a shot the assaulting column tore away the slashed timber and other obstacles in its path and rushed like a mighty torrent over the entrenchments a desperate hand-to-hand -hand encounter now followed in which men fought like demons using their bayonets and clubbed muskets when in too close contact to load and fire the main assault fell on johnson's division of lee's army lee was led to believe that there was an intention to attack his left and he had sent most of johnson's artillery to strengthen that flank johnson had his suspicions aroused during the night that there were preparations under way for attacking his front and had induced lee to order the artillery back by a strange coincidence it arrived just as johnson's line was carried and before the guns could fire a shot they fell into hancock's hands besides capturing general stuart and johnson he took nearly four thousand prisoners thirty pieces of artillery several thousand stands of small arms and about thirty colors his troops swept on half a mile driving the enemy before them in confusion and did not pause till they encountered a second line of entrenchments the enemy was now driven to desperation and every effort was bent toward retaking his lost works reinforcements were rushed forward by lee as soon as he saw the threatening condition of matters at the angle and a formidable counter movement was rapidly organized against hancock as our troops were upon unknown territory and as their formations had been thrown into considerable confusion by the rapidity of their movements they withdrew slowly before the attack to the main line of works they had captured and turning them against the enemy held them successfully during all the terrific struggle that followed by six o'clock a m wright was on that portion of the field and his men were placed on the right of the angle 
scarcely had he taken up this position when the confederates made a determined and savage attack upon him but despite their well-directed efforts they failed to capture the line wright was wounded early in the fight but refused to leave the field hancock had placed some artillery upon high ground and his guns fired over the heads of our troops and did much execution in the ranks of the enemy warren had been directed to make an attack before eight o'clock in order to prevent the enemy from massing troops upon the centre in an effort to retake the angle but he was slow in carrying out the order although the instructions were of the most positive and urgent character he did not accomplish the work expected of him a little before eleven o'clock general grant became so anxious that he directed general meade to relieve warren if he did not attack promptly and to put general humphreys in command of his corps general meade concurred in this course and said that he would have relieved warren without an order to that effect if there had been any further delay general grant said to one or two of us who were near him i feel sorry to be obliged to send such an order in regard to warren he is an officer for whom i had conceived a very high regard his quickness of perception personal gallantry and soldierly bearing pleased me and a few days ago i should have been inclined to place him in command of the army of the potomac in case meade had been killed but i began to feel after his want of vigor in assaulting on the eighth that he was not as efficient as i had believed and his delay in attacking and the feeble character of his assaults to-day confirmed me in my apprehensions this was said in a kindly spirit but with an air of serious disappointment longstreet's troops had continued to confront warren knowing that to lose that part of the enemy's line would expose the troops at the angle to a flank attack and the obstacles to a successful assault were really very formidable warren was blamed not so much for not carrying the line in his front as for delays in making the attack the general now started for another part of the field and kept moving from point to point to get a close view of the fighting on different parts of the line once or twice he called for a powerful field glass belonging to badeau this was rather unusual for the general never carried a glass himself and seldom used one he was exceptionally far-sighted and generally trusted to his natural vision in examining the field badeau's near-sightedness made him very dependent on his glass a few days before while he was using it a battery commander who was passing attempted a professional joke by remarking i say badeau can you see richmond not quite answered the colonel though i hope to some day better have the barrels of your glass rifled so that it will carry farther suggested the artillerist before riding far the general came to a humble-looking farmhouse which was within range of the enemy's guns and surrounded by wounded men sullen-looking prisoners and terror-stricken stragglers the fences were broken the ground was furrowed by shells and the place presented a scene which depicted war in its most repulsive aspect an old lady and her daughter were standing on the porch when the mother was told that the officer passing was the general-in-chief she ran toward him and with tears running down her cheeks threw up her arms and cried thank god thank god i again behold the glorious flag of the union that i have not laid eyes on for three long terrible years thank the lord that i have at last seen the commander of the union armies i am proud to say that my husband and my son went from here to serve in those armies but i have been cut off from all communication and can get no tidings of them oh you don't know sir what a loyal woman suffers in this land but the coming of the union troops makes me feel that deliverance is at last at hand and that the gates have been opened for my escape from this hell the general was so touched by this impassioned speech and felt so firmly convinced that the woman was telling the truth that he dismounted and went into the yard and sat for a little time on the porch to learn the details of her story and to see what he could do to comfort and succour her she gave an account of her persecutions and sufferings which would have moved the sternest heart the general finding that she was without food ordered a supply of rations to be issued to her and her daughter and promised to have inquiries set on foot to ascertain the whereabouts of her husband and son she was profuse in her expressions of gratitude for these acts of kindness her story was afterward found to be true in every particular i had been anxious to participate in the scenes occurring at the angle and now got permission to go there and look after some new movements which had been ordered 
lee made five assaults in all that day in a series of desperate and even reckless attempts to retake his main line of earthworks but each time his men were hurled back defeated and he had to content himself in the end with throwing up a new line further in his rear the battle near the angle was probably the most desperate engagement in the history of modern warfare and presented features which were absolutely appalling it was chiefly a savage hand-to-hand -hand fight across the breastworks rank after rank was riddled by shot and shell and bayonet thrust and finally sank a mass of torn and mutilated corpses then fresh troops rushed madly forward to replace the dead and so the murderous work went on guns were run up close to the parapet and double charges of canister played their part in the bloody work the fence rails and logs in the breastworks were shattered into splinters and trees over a foot and a half in diameter were cut completely in two by the incessant musketry fire a section of the trunk of a stout oak tree thus severed was afterward sent to washington where it is still on exhibition at the national museum we had not only shot down an army but also a forest the opposing flags were in places thrust against each other and muskets were fired with muzzles against muzzle skulls were crushed with clubbed muskets and men stabbed to death with swords and bayonets thrust between the logs in the parapet which separated the combatants wild cheers savage yells and frantic shrieks rose above the sighing of the wind and the pattering of the rain and formed a demoniacal accompaniment to the booming of the guns as they hurled their missiles of death into the contending ranks even the darkness of night and the pitiless storm failed to stop the fierce contest and the deadly strife did not cease till after midnight our troops had been under fire for twenty hours but they still held the position which they had so dearly purchased my duties carried me again to the spot the next day and the appalling sight presented was harrowing in the extreme our own killed were scattered over a large space near the angle while in front of the captured breastworks the enemy's dead vastly more numerous than our own were piled upon each other in some places four layers deep exhibiting every ghastly phase of mutilation below the mass of fast decaying corpses the convulsive twitching of limbs and the writhing of bodies showed that there were wounded men still alive and struggling to extricate themselves from their horrid entombment every relief possible was afforded but in too many cases it came too late the place was well named the bloody angle the results of the battle are best summed up in the report which the general-in-chief sent to washington at six thirty p m may twelfth he wrote to halleck as follows the eighth day of battle closes leaving between three and four thousand prisoners in our hands for the day's work including two general officers and over thirty pieces of artillery the enemy are obstinate and seem to have found the last ditch we have lost no organization not even that of a company whilst we have destroyed and captured one division johnson's one brigade dole's and one regiment entire of the enemy the confederates had suffered greatly in general officers two had been killed four severely wounded and two captured our loss in killed wounded and missing was less than seven thousand that of the enemy between nine and ten thousand as nearly as could be ascertained End of chapter six